I'd like to introduce you, first of all, to Richard Sharif, who is the former NATO Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. In 2016, he published the book entitled 2017 War with Russia, an urgent warning from senior military command. And I think you were very brave to put it in the context of a novel, which is much more digestible for more people. Um, the book is part fictional and suggests how Russia could easily invade the Baltic states, that war between Russia and NATO is possible, and that we are unprepared of delivering a capable response. In the prologue, um, Mr. Sharif quotes Trotsky, and he says, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. So now I would like to give the floor to Richard Sharif. Well, Jody, thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to be with you here in Vesprem, and I'd very much like to thank uh, Ferenc and uh, my, my guide and host and uh, who's been organizing it all, uh, Dr. Ivana Stepanovic, for, for, for making it all possible. Um, it, what is particular pleasure is that this is such a, a broad international community, and I'm, in that context, delighted to meet a couple uh, of attendees from the country of my birth, Kenya, um, because it just also, not only is it great to meet Ken fellow Kenyans, and if, if I may presume to say that, I lived there until I was born there and lived there until I was eight, but it just widens the aperture away from any discussion about what many of you who are not from Europe might think of as a European problem. In other words, the, the Russo-Ukraine war. In the last 12 months or so, as well as the war in Ukraine, there has been a catastrophic war and it continues in Tigray between Ethiopia and, and, and the Tigrayans, aided and abetted by the Eritreans. Over half a million casualties. And we don't have to go back very far to the civil war in DRC and the Congo with over five million casualties. So you may well say, well, what's so special about this? Where was Europe when Africa was suffering and is suffering these wars? And it's a very good question. I have no answers to that, suffice it to say, except that it is like, it's, it's about self-interest. But I think there's a wider point here it's about the, the means and the capability of the international community, principally the United Nations, to control, prevent, resolve that scourge of war. <coughs> and what makes the Russia-Ukraine war so pernicious, perhaps in international context, is the fact that the prosecutor of that war, Russia, is also a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council and a signatory to the UN Charter of Human Rights. So I think we need to re recall that. This did not come out of a clear blue sky. And I want to take you back to the Kremlin in March, March the 14th precisely, 2014, March the 18th, 2014, which was the day that Russia incorporated Crimea into the Russian Federation. And in, outside in Red Square, Putin waved, uh, people waved banners. Glory to Russia, glory to Putin. And inside, Putin made a speech, which continued a theme we probably first heard in public or in international context at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. And I want to remind you, of course, that here is the man who described that the breakup of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century and the man who has since called for a new Yalta as the most appropriate security settlement for Europe. And here in Hungary, which of course was in many ways a victim of the old Yalta, I suspect those words carried particular resonance. In that speech, he majored on the West the threat poses to Russia. And I quote, time and again, we were deceived. Time and again, decisions were made behind our backs. And the same happened when they made, in other words, NATO, made their expansion to the east with the deployment of military structures on our borders. A fact, Secretary of State Baker, when Germany reunified, said 
NATO would not move troops into the former East Germany. And that did not happen. Nothing was said about free, democratic, newly uh, new states that emerged out of the, the old Warsaw Pact, putting themselves forward for, for NATO membership voluntarily and being satisfying the criteria for NATO membership and being accepted. He set that grievance in a historical context to make it resonate more. We have all the reasons to believe, he said, that the policy of containment of Russia that was happening in the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th centuries is still going on. And he warned the West to expect Russia to push back. If you press the spring, it will release at some point, something you should remember. As for Ukraine, we are not just neighbors. We are one nation. Kiev is the mother of Russian cities. And what he described as the latest events in Ukraine were the product of terror, murder, pogroms conducted by anti-Semites, Russophobes, nationalists, and neo-Nazis, language which has continued to emanate from the poison in the Kremlin. And his vision for the future Uniting Russian speakers under Russia is the desire of the people. The absolute majority of the people is clear. 95% of the Russian population think that Russia should protect the interests of Russians, even if it will worsen our relations with some states. And, of course, he was predictably reassuring about the future of Ukraine and what he calls other regions, by which we can infer he means other states with significant Russian ethnic minorities. Don't trust those who frighten you with Russia, he said, those who say that Crimea will be followed by other regions. We do not want to split Ukraine. Well, he was right. He doesn't want to split Ukraine. He wants Ukraine as part of a new Putin-Russian empire. And his deeds have matched his words, the annexation of Crimea. That expectation in 2014, March 2014, that he was on the point of invading Ukraine as he assembled tank armies and airborne divisions and outloaded ammunition and other logistics and built field hospitals, presaging an offensive operation into Ukraine. Actually, what we then saw was the proxy wars in Donetsk and Luhansk and the war in Ukraine, which started in 2014 and before 24th of February last year, when he did invade, of course, as we all know, some 10,000 Ukrainians had already been killed in that war. And, effectively, a state of mind in the Kremlin with a, that, that said that the, that the Kremlin is at war with, with the rest and with NATO. And that's not me talking, that's Dmitry Trenin, who heads up the Carnegie Moscow Foundation, who wrote in 2016 that the Kremlin has been at war with the West since 2014. Well, what does he want? Number one, he wants Russia firmly established as a great power. He wants to re-establish a Russian empire in the former republics of the Soviet Union. First of all, wiping Ukraine off the map as a sovereign state. And then I'm, th I'm sure that he would have done if he could and will continue to do if he can at some stage in the future. Turn his attention to Georgia, to Moldova, and quite possibly uh, to the Baltic states, and of course he's already got 20% of Georgia since the invasion of 2008. And the only thing that's stopping him of that, of course, is the fact that he has been, his armed forces have been effectively fixed in Ukraine. He absolutely wants to see the destruction of NATO, an alliance he sees as a direct threat to Russia, and he absolutely wants to decouple America from European defence. But let's be clear about this. Putin is a blood-stained tyrant who has afflicted unspeakable pain and suffering on a democratic, peaceful neighbor. But in a real sense, it takes two to tango. And if NATO and if the West had behaved differently, we perhaps might not be here where we are right now. So it's perhaps worth going over the last few years because it has implications for the way we behave in future. I would highlight the cumulative defence cuts, particularly in Western Europe and the Western European NATO countries, and I'd include Canada in that, 
So one transatlantic partner is not completely off the hook, which have sent a message of weakness. That Bucharest summit, NATO Bucharest summit in 2007, with the promise of NATO membership to Ukraine and to Georgia. You either make a promise and you back it up, or you don't make the promise in the first place. And if we look back to the context of 2007, a promise of NATO membership would have meant that unconditional guarantee of collective defense article under Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which says an attack, an armed attack on one is an attack on all. And to ensure Ukrainian or Georgian security under those terms would have meant NATO being ready to put troops on the ground in Ukraine, aircraft in the skies above Ukraine and Georgia to deter Russian attack. And in the context of 2007, that is very, very difficult to have seen. So perhaps that promise was a promise too far. Georgia, 2008. In many ways, I think, our Rhineland moment. And by our Rhineland moment, I'm referring to Hitler's reoccupation of the Rhineland in 1936, which was the first time, in a sense, the newly, relatively new Nazi regime began to wave its stick and the West let it get on with it. And indeed, after 2008, NATO returned to business as usual. And in 2010, the NATO strategic concept stated that Russia should become our most important strategic partner. The UK Defence Review of 2010, in a particular UK context, which said there is no existential threat to these islands. And that subsequent dismantling of Western NATO warfighting capability. And to be honest, the sound of chickens coming home to roost right now on that score is deafening. I would highlight that red line that Obama drew in the sand, metaphorically speaking, over the use of chemical weapons in Syria in 2013. And when they were used, oh well, it's one of those things. The US withdrawal from military capability from Europe. And indeed, the, and to a certain extent, that focus on the Asia-Pacific region, which is understandable for American foreign policy of concerns, but I would also highlight, suggest that American security is not only European security, but European security is also American security. And the Trump years. Trump was right on one thing when he called to account NATO member states for failing to meet that 2% minimum of GDP on defence. But equally, his treatment of the alliance partners uh, with considerable contempt and his cozying up to adversaries also sent a signal. I would highlight that statement by President Macron that NATO is brain dead. That's a comment on France as much as anybody because NATO is no more, no less than the sum of the now 30 member states which make it up. And I would also highlight the catastrophe of the collapse of the NATO mission in Afghanistan in the summer of 2021, which I think had a direct bearing on the timing of the invasion of Ukraine. Of course, that collapse was effectively President Biden pulling the rug unilaterally from under what was a NATO mission without any discussion or consultation uh, with his allies, all sending a message that NATO is a busted flush. Well, Friday, of course, is the 12-month anniversary of the launch of this war, <coughs> in which Putin, but not only Putin, made three fundamental miscalculations. Number one, that he failed to recognize, and I think many of us felt the same. I think all of us knew Ukrainians would fight like tigers, but I don't think anybody expected Ukraine under the leadership of President Zelensky to show such not only courage, resilience, determination, cleverness, agility. They have given us a masterclass in campaign design and campaign implementation. I don't think any of us expected the Russian armed forces to be quite as incompetent as they have been. They have consistently failed to demonstrate the most basic principles of an understanding of combined arms warfare, by which I mean to the non-military among you, that is bringing together 
the orchestra of different military capabilities in which one capability can offset the vulnerabilities of another to produce a concentrated synergistic effect. A failure of command, a failure of planning, a catastrophic failure of logistics, a sign of a kleptocratic corrupt state which has insidiously undermined its own military capability through corruption and kleptomania, and a failure of morale and discipline, all of which has led catastrophically, of course, to Plan B, the mass destruction, mass artillery, destruction of cities, the, uh, the destruction of, nu of Ukrainian power capabilities, the assault on cities, and, of course, most grimly of all, the massacre of civilians, the use of mass rape as a weapon of war, the deportation of children and other civilians into Russia, effectively genocide. And the final miscalculation by Russia was the extent to which the West, and by which I mean NATO and other democratic states focused uh, opposing Russia, have rallied to Ukraine's cause. And I think the story here is, if one was marking it, is good, but could be better. Without that support from NATO, uh, and indeed, of course, the European Union, particularly on the financial side, Ukraine would not have been able to conduct the defense of its homeland uh, that the Ukrainians have done so impressively. But more could be done. I think looking back on it, if one had been asked last summer, whether Western unity and NATO unity would be as strong in February 2023 that it has been, I think one have, would have raised doubts about that. The dependence on Russian energy, the impact of the, de the withdrawal of Russian energy over, a, 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 over the, the, the winter in Europe. Was all this going to be a presage to European nations pushing President Zelensky to accept some form of ceasefire. Thus far, it has not happened. That ringing declaration at the Madrid summit in September last year, the NATO Madrid summit, that NATO would continue to provide whatever, provide whatever support Ukraine needed to do the job, has maintained a pretty strong consensus thus far. Although I would highlight the fact that the provision of NATO support has been a dribble rather than a clout. We've seen that discussion, the hand wringing in certain countries, Germany particularly, about the provision of tanks. And many countries, of course, within NATO, not providing any military support at all, although many have really gone, a whole, gone, gone the whole hog as much as possible. But talk of a negotiated ceasefire is still there, perhaps, in the media, and in certain sectors, but at the moment, officially, it's off the table. As for the campaign itself, I think that dribbling of resources in has coloured where we are in the campaign. We saw stunning Ukrainian successes last year. The battle for Kiev, which sent the Russians packing back into Belarus. The, the offensive the summer offensive northeast uh, of Kharkiv, again, sent the Russians in headlong retreat and regained significant amount of Ukrainian territory. The liberation of Kherson in the south, where the Ukrainians targeted Russian logistics, Russian routes, logistics supply routes across the, the Dnipro River. And this was a classic in a sense because it forced the, the, uh, the Russians to withdraw of their own accord without the Ukrainians needing to put in what would have been a grim attritional fight in the city of Kherson. But there's a number of what ifs. If the West had given the Ukrainians the means to prosecute uh, an offensive earlier, if there hadn't been some invidious distinction between defensive weapons and offensive weapons, as an ex-soldier I will tell you, the best means of defense is attack. Maybe 
just maybe the Ukrainians may have been in a position uh, to capitalize on, that, on their success in the south at Kherson and may have been in a position while the Russians were in, in some disarray, they might have been able to attack and gain even more ground. But since then, we've seen the initial chaos of the Russian mobilization of large numbers of young men and indeed not so young men steady. We've seen reinforcement. Uh, we've seen these grim attritional battles in the, in the Donbass, in Luhansk, Bakhmut and Solidar. Some Russian tactical successes, albeit at the cost of casualties of killed on a scale which would not look out of place to anybody who had seen the battlefield of Verdun or the Somme or Passchendaele in the First World War. But meanwhile, of course, the Russians have also managed to dig and prepare extensive defensive positions in the south, which is going to make any further Ukrainian successes even more complicated and even more difficult. So where is it going to go? Well, I think the situation is pretty balanced at the moment. There is a Russian offensive ongoing at the moment in the centre, in the, in the eastern Donbass. On the face of it, two divisions sounds like a significant force. But all the intelligence, and there is a plethora of open source intelligence, which is pretty well analysed, pretty well validated, and pretty well corroborated. And I think one can take uh, you know, the, its assessments, as much of the assessments, particularly the assessments by the Institute for the Study of Warfare, is pretty near the truth. Most assessments say that the Russians lack the resources and the capability and the equipment to turn those, that offensive into something decisive. Bear in mind, the Russians are losing casualties. On one assessment I saw, 800 plus killed a day. They probably lost half the tank fleet they had before the war started. Over a thousand tanks destroyed, some 500 captured. Now, the, you can't make up those losses that easily. So the Russians are on the offensive at the moment. Where will this go? Well, it all depends on a number of variables. Number one is logistics and ammunition. This is a war that is demanding ammunition expenditures on a scale not seen since the Second World War. Vast numbers of ammunition, and of course, in most Western countries providing support to uh, Ukraine. Assumptions about daily expenditure of ammunition rates were dramatically downscaled as a result of the years since the end of the Cold War, when the assumption of a threat of industrial state-on-state -state warfare had rather gone away, or at least was deeply unfashionable. Many of us thought differently, but nevertheless, that's where we are. So industry is not tooled up to produce the ammunition on the scale required to support uh, the Ukrainians as they need to support if they are to mount a really meaningful offensive. So other means have to be found. I would also say that the ability to mobilize, train and deploy troops by both Ukraine and by Russia is critical. We have seen that scooping up, that mobilization by Russia, 300,000 young men pulled up off the streets, given absolutely no proper training at all. 11 days later, they're in the firing line and they've been dying in droves. Meanwhile, Ukraine is also mobilizing, has also mobilized and is training significant numbers of its, of its, of its people. And, uh, and other countries in the West have also been providing that training as well. So it's about how quickly the Ukrainians can assimilate equipment, train its soldiers in the use of that equipment, put in place the logistic support and the logistic demands are massive. And you can just imagine the challenge faced by any Ukrainian technical quartermaster when he's, off, when he's asked to provide logistic support for two or three different sorts of tank, two or three different sorts of armed vehicle, as well as the training challenges as well are significant.
So that ability to mobilize more quickly than the enemy is going to be critical to the success uh, of Ukraine or indeed of Russia. And variable number three is the willingness of the West to provide more sophisticated ground and indeed air offensive capabilities to Ukraine. Thus far, a stepped approach, I call it dribbling in, has been the marker. We're getting over one barrier after another. We're over the barrier of tanks. When will we get over the barrier of fighter aircraft? But remember, of course, the provision of fighter aircraft is not an immediate panacea. You can't just say to the Ukrainians, here's a bunch of F-16s, go ahead, use them. It takes months, if not years, to train the pilots and months, if not years, to put in place the logistics and the capabilities to support complex, sophisticated, uh, NATO standard for, uh, air, uh, offensive aircraft. But it's also about providing the capability for long-range precision missiles and the like, all the means to allow Ukraine to put together an offensive. I would highlight China as a variable. Thus far, China, despite that profession of an un unbreakable bond of friendship between President Xi and President Putin uh, just, uh, just over a year ago before the, the Winter Olympics, China has been quite circumspect. Um, I'm sure China is looking at Ukraine, the Ukraine war, and learning lessons from it to ensure that when and if it decides to have a go at Taiwan, it doesn't make the mistakes that Russia has made. But at the same time, thus far, China has been pretty leery about providing military support in any direct form to Russia. And indeed, there were significant protestations from Beijing when it was accused as such last year. But I note a mention in the paper today that there is a real concern um, that China might decide to change that policy. And if it did change that policy and started providing military support to Russia, well, that could see a significant shift in Russian fortunes. And I think the fifth variable is the strategic leadership of particularly of, of two men, President Zelensky and President Biden, and their ability uh, to, sus to sustain and nurture the will not only of their own people, but in President Biden's case, the alliance as well. And of course, President Zelensky has a significant part to play here. And as we saw with his recent visits to UK and to France, he is a master at uh, winning the battle of the narrative. And indeed, more broadly, of course, I think the Ukrainian success in the overall Barrett battle of the narrative has been a remarkable feature of this campaign. But President Biden's leadership has been vital in hardening Western resolve and NATO resolve and coordinating that steady flow of aid to Ukraine. But this year, we can expect both men to be under greater pressure from Europe and from some in the US Congress to explore peaceful resolutions to the war. And meanwhile, President Putin, who you might say is the third variable under in terms of leadership, is playing for time, hoping that the West gradually tires of the war in 2023. Putin's strategy for Russia is to out-suffer the West. And we'll have to see where that goes. But it does ultimately depend on Western resolve holding. So what for the future? Can there be a peaceful resolution to this? I think we have to accept the reality that there won't be peace in Europe while Putin is in the Kremlin. Once again, in Europe, We've got a blood-stained tyrant prepared to do the unspeakable to his neighbours, democratic, peaceful neighbours. And the more blood that is shed, in a sense, the more blood is demanded. Two generations ago, our forebears had to do what needed to be done. But Hungary, of, all, of course, of all countries, knows the cost of that. Even if and when the guns fall silent in Ukraine, I think we have to make the assumption 
that there will be no fundamental leadership change or no fundamental change from Russia, whoever is in the Kremlin, and that Russia will use any opportunity given to it by a, uh, the guns falling silent to regroup, to rebuild, to retrain, and to have another go. Russia has arguably never been a nation state in the sense that France is a nation state or Spain since the Middle Ages a nation state, Germany since reunification or since unification has been a nation state. Russia has been an empire throughout its history and it has survived in a sense by expansion, by growing. Um, I think that is deep in the Russian DNA. And in a very real sense, I simplify, of course, but the story of Russia is a story of, of expansion, imperialist expansion, of overreaching itself, of collapsing or withdrawing, over, overstretching it, withdrawing, retrenching, and then starting all over again. I think we Europeans, I say that in the broadest sense, face the prospect in the long term, of a deeply traumatised state on Europe's boundaries with imperialist ambitions deep in its DNA. The so what for us, I think, as Europeans, is that we'll have an angry, destructive, ultra-nationalist, revanchist state, still feeling it has some sort of divine right to establish a third Rome, determined to rebuild a Russian empire, determined to remove Ukraine as, from the map as an independent country and potentially other post-Soviet republics, Georgia and Moldova particularly, right on NATO's border potentially for decades to come. So we have a generational challenge to deter Russia, which needs a transatlantic strategy for the non-NATO post-Soviet state. I think this requires a fundamental change of mindset in NATO. When, President, when Prime Minister Sunak says that NATO has to double down, as he did on Saturday at the Munich Security Conference, that doesn't only mean double down on provision of military support and other support to Ukraine to give Ukraine to do the tools it needs to do the job. It means doubling down on our own European defence and security. Only if we are prepared for the worst case can we genuinely offer a deterrence to Russia. And being prepared for the worst case means we have to be ready, and palatable as it may sound, for a, a war with Russia. And that means significant increases in defence spending, significant increase in, 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 in all the logistics and sustainability and the sinews that that requires. Looking at our own civil defence, looking at the way we conducted ourselves during the Cold War and perhaps looking, learning lessons from that for what is going to be, as I say, a generational challenge. I think we've got to think very carefully about security, long-term security for Ukraine when the, when the firing stops. My own view is that there's no alternative to Ukraine becoming part of NATO. Those promises uh, made at the Bucharest summit uh, the Budapest summit, I beg your pardon, or the Budapest memorandum in 1994 were utterly worthless. So there's got to be a bridging, say, because it's not going to happen yet and for a long time. There's got to be some means of bridging that gap. And ultimately, NATO has got to be prepared to put its money where its mouth is and be prepared to effectively deter, and that may mean putting troops in, on the ground in Ukraine one day and aircraft in the skies above. But in the context of this meeting, and I touched on it when I made a couple of remarks at the press conference earlier, as well as deterrence, dialogue is fundamental. We have to find ways to reach into Russian minds, reach into what exists in Russian civil society in a similar way, perhaps, that happened at the, in the later stages of the Cold War whether it was through Samizdat Literature or Voice of America or Radio Free Europe or BBC World Service or other media means or Finnish television or German television beamed into East Germany, whatever, to try and 
get the message through to the Russian, to Russian people, what is being done in their name. And perhaps culture and education has a really important part to play here. We all have a common heritage, whether it's Tchaikovsky or Pushkin or Turgenev or Tolstoy. These are cultural icons for all of us. And I think we've got to be so careful about pulling down those icons because we have to build on what exists as a means of communication between us. And by way, if for our, a more interna international perspective, I think there's real messages here and massive implications for the international community. Not only the fact that a permanent member of the P5, of the, of the United Nations and a signatory to the Charter of Human Rights is inflicting unspeakable suffering on a liberal, peaceful, democratic neighbour. But if Russia prevails, what does that say for the victory of, in terms of sending a message about the power of naked imperialism and might is right. Where does that leave values of international freedom, democracy, rule of law? Where does that leave the UN Charter of Human Rights? And of course, where does that leave that green light effectively to the use of nuclear saber rattling as a means of blackmail? And I haven't even begun to touch on the economic consequences of the war which are affecting, will affect every nation that depends on Ukrainian grain supplies or Russian grain supplies as well for its food. Jody touched on that line from Trotsky, you may not want war, but this war wants you. they are chilling words of Trotsky. But I was also, also like to remind you of that Roman maxim. If you want peace, prepare for war. Thank you. <laughs>